Hey, hey. That was a long one. Praise the Lord, huh? Well, shalom, everybody. Shalom. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Shalom. Shalom. Amen. You know what? I got to start off today being a little bit upset at you guys. <coughs> Only a little bit because you didn't invite me to the burger next week. Oh. How could you, I mean, cheeseburger? Come on. Oh. Why am I here this week? How come I'm not here next week? No. <laughs> yeah, I get the best cheeseburgers in Valley Vista, right? Yes. Oh, you're King, you're King, you're King. Well, you're invited. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I just wanted to get that little joke out of the way. So it's going to be back. You know, we're praising the Lord. Uh, this is one of the few churches, actually, that's having special guests come anymore. You know, everyone's still scared, it seems, in Las Vegas, uh, you know, of the disease. And, and uh, just kind of focusing on themselves. And we got to get back out there, right? Start living again. Not only as a, as a body of Messiah, as a, as a church, but also as individuals, too, and, and uh, get out there. So we're very excited because our ministry now is starting up in, uh, on campus at UNLV. And in two weeks, we've had five salvations. Just in two weeks. So we're praising God. He gets the glory always. And um, the first week, my wife led two students to the Lord. So let's have on stand up. I just want to be able to see you. you know. Actually, she needs to stand on the chair. <laughs> so you can see her, just see it, yeah. But we're doing really well. You know, we're praising, we're, we're getting older. I don't know if you knew that. Our kids are all old now. You know, they used to come, you know, but now they're all old. They're their own kids, you know what I mean? They're 21 and above. And uh, they used to, remember we had kids? They were this tall when they came, and I think one of them was still a baby. So that was 20 plus years ago. My son is 21. Rebecca got married last year. She's coming up on her year anniversary next week. She's 23, and then Stephanie now 25, and she's getting married in December. So praise the Lord, they found good Christian guys. We're very happy with them. And uh, they're just living their own lives now, you know? So empty nest syndrome has hit our house. So, uh, but we still have one left. Oh, we do have two, but she, you know, she works and then she's with her boyfriend, you know. They're getting married, so they got lots of things to do. So we barely see them at all. So we got one left and, and uh, so we're working on him. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? <laughs> So, uh, in any event, God's really blessed and we're very excited. And we have this campus ministry. Last year, God opened the door for salvations and, you know, the students really started to start thinking in a spiritual way. And when they hear the gospel, they got saved. So we had like, I, you know, I haven't counted, but it was about 35 salvations last year. And my wife led most of them to the Lord. So God was really drawing students to her and through her to be able to lead them to the Lord. And we're very excited. But, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done on campus there. It's very liberal, and uh, the students are really caught up in that. But they're seeing the light. And you know what it was? It was the COVID situation, being stuck at home for two years or a year and a half, whatever it was for them. And uh, they really started to wake up and start thinking, you know, they had actual time to think, you know what I mean? When you're stuck at home and you got nothing to do and just do schoolwork and play game, you know, video games and, you know, you have some time to think. So they started thinking, I think, and uh, at least that's what some of them were telling me. And because uh, we were asking them, why are you, why are you starting to believe in Jesus? You know, because, well, because of everything that's going on and what's going on in the world. So we can use that to our benefit when we're sharing about God. You know, because the Bible has already, it's all laid out for us, folks. It's all laid out. We know, though, this is going to happen. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, you know what? There's going to be disease, worldwide disease. He called it pestilence. And so, yeah, it's going to happen. And uh, so we need to be continually prepared to be able to explain that to folks. And I do it. We do it on campus. 
And uh, this past week, I got my little bullhorn, and I was preaching out loud to everybody. And, and a lot of the students were walking by, and they were just looking at me. <laughs> Not only were they looking at me like, you're strange, you know. Yeah, but they're also looking at me like, what is going on at UNLV, you know what I mean? And it's only for, you know, a little time period, uh, you know, once a week we're there, uh, but we're praying for a Bible club on campus. You need to pray for our campuses just around the world and here in the United States because they're all going to be woke now. Yeah. They're moving into the wokeness situation. And, um, you know, it's kind of sad. It's really sad to see. And students, they got nowhere to go. And Christian students, they got nowhere to go, so we want to start up a Bible club there, but they need a leader. You know, it's kind of like Rick over there, you know, he, he needs help, you know. <laughs> I need a leader to do this Bible club on campus, so if anybody knows anybody that's interested in that, just let me know. And um, so our ministry really got exciting this last year or so. My wife and I, we were approached to start a TV show. And a friend of mine just called me up and said, you want to do a TV show? I said, sure, why not? <laughs> he said, okay. And he put it all together. He got people to fund it. And so he did 12 TV shows, national TV shows. It was on CTN, an organization I never heard of before. But they are nationally around, you know, yeah, CTN. I don't know if you get them out here, but uh, there are a, a lot of different places. But if you go to our website, you can watch the TV shows. And my wife was in part of the TV shows, not willingly necessarily. <laughs> I kind of pushed her in that direction. I said, oh, I need a, I need a co-host, because you got to do it. You know? She said, okay, I'll do it. She doesn't like the limelight, you know that. So, uh, but anyways, we really had a fun time, and now I know how to produce a show. I know how to direct a show. I, I know how to write a show. So it's really, uh, really a lot of fun, and we had a great time. And... Uh, but uh, right now we're in limbo uh, on that situation, but you can pray for it. It's called The Watchman. So in your bulletin on that second page, there's information about me. It says I'm Pastor Beth Yeshua. Well, our website is Beth Yeshua, LV, for Las Vegas, .org. So you can use Beth Yeshua in your bulletin. Just put LV. You can go to our videos on that site. You can go to Facebook and YouTube. There's a lot of videos there, and our TV show is on there as well. So you can check it out. We did a lot of feasts, a lot of talking about the feasts. So, uh, and teaching, you know, it's a teaching show. It's just a half hour show, so it's really cool. So anyways, just to give you a little, little fast here, the Lord has blessed our ministry in 22, uh, I think we're starting our 23rd year of ministry in Las Vegas now. Can you imagine that? Has anybody lived that long in Las Vegas? No, you're right, yeah. <laughs> Lord, take us out anytime. Uh, yeah, we just got through a whole week of 110. Every day was 110. Can you imagine that? It must have been hot out here, too. But we had 110 for like a week, and now it's down to 99, and I'm like, oh, it's so cold. <laughs> yeah, my mom's like, yeah, it was like uh, 70 degrees in New Jersey, you know? So I'm like, yeah, 99 is cold for us. What do you think, right? So, uh, oh, I was going to tell you, in that many years now, we've led uh, 1,450 people to the Lord. 80 of those are Jewish people, so praise the Lord, yes. We're, we're just excited, and we really think there's going to be revival coming. We're seeing it on campus. You know, it's like all of a sudden these kids want to get saved, you know. 20 years we've been preaching on campus. Actually, now this is our 23rd year, and last year we had the most salvations, I think, in all the 20 years before then, yeah. We had a few here and there, but it's a very tough city. You know that, Las Vegas, city of sin, and uh, they revel in it. They do revel in it, folks. So, All right, so that's our ministry. We're preaching the gospel to Jewish people and Gentiles as well. Of course, you know, we love everybody. Well, you know what? I'm just happy anybody would just listen to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, if they're going to listen, then praise the Lord. I led a young lady to the Lord last week as well, so that was exciting. And, uh, you know, we just want to get good follow-up. You know, it's so difficult with these kids these days. You know, you text them. I mean, you figure texting is like the most popular way to do it nowadays. But no, they don't respond. Yet we have one baptism out of all those kids we have led to the Lord last year. One baptism. That was it. So, got to pray. We got to pray, you know. 
So that's why we need a club on campus to, 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 to get them rallied together. And, and you know what? It's all about this. It's all about reading the word, studying, and growing, you know, and being graceful in the process, right? All right. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. We're going to talk about the Ezekiel War. We've got a little prophecy teaching here, of course. You know, that's kind of my favorite subject, prophecy. I wrote a book on prophecy, Israel in Prophecy. It's also through the website, so if you want to get it, you can go there. I, I, I didn't bring it because I haven't bought any books lately. We do have my other book uh, on Galatians, if you're interested in that. It's on the table out there. we got some t-shirts as well. I love those t-shirts because uh, I use them to evangelize. I Love Israel t-shirt or Jesus Loves You t-shirt with a star David. Jewish people just love those shirts. And even Christians love them too. If I wear that shirt and I walk to the, to the uh, airport, there's at least one or two people that will come up and say, hey, I like your shirt, you know. I like your shirt. I'm like, hey, are you a believer? And usually they are, you know. Or they're Jewish, you know. They'll come up, you know, they're Jewish. And then, hey, are you a believer? And like, they look at me like, what? I said, let me explain. And that's how I remember to share the gospel with them. So, very cool. All right, how much time do we have? We're here, like, you told me, like, two hours, I think, right? What was that, two hours? <laughs> Just grab a pillow, you know, and uh, okay, okay. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, chapter 38 and 39, we're not going to cover all of 39, just a couple of verses, okay? But both chapters talk about the Ezekiel War. The Ezekiel War is a war that's going to come up against Israel. And these nations that are identified in these chapters are going to attack Israel. And I believe they're going to be uh, they're going to be attacking them really anytime soon, anytime now. Okay. And as we go through this chapter, I'm going to just point out the scriptures that kind of point us to this this war that's going to happen soon. And I really, you know what? I mean, unfortunately, yeah, war is bad, right? But it's exciting for us to be able to see it to come alive because prophecy is. There's a point to prophecy. And in the scriptures, there's like hundreds, hundreds of prophecies that God performed, right? And wrote down in the scriptures. He predicted them. And guess what? Every single one of them has come true. So God is 100% correct when he prophesies in his word. Now, some of the prophecies, and there's still many, have not been fulfilled as yet. So if God is 100% perfect in the past... What do you think is going to happen in the future? Yeah, he's going to be 100%. There's no prophecy or prophet in this world, especially of the world, that is 100%. They're not even close. You know, Jean Dixon. Everybody remember Jean Dixon a long time ago? She was a prophetess. And if you look her up in her bio, it says she performed, or she was right about 40% of the time. And that would be extremely high in anybody's standards, right? Extremely high. But God is 100% correct. 100%. So who are we going to believe? Gene Dixon, who's 60% wrong, or God who's 100% right? I'm going to go with God. Amen? Yeah, I think we all should be here. Right? Okay. So in any event, this prophecy is still yet to happen. But as we go through, you're going to see uh, that it's really, it, it could happen any day now. And it's really, I mean, it's amazing to see it come alive in our lives today. And that's what I'm going to show you, how it's all coming together. All right. First six verses are going to identify who Gog and Magog and the Confederacy is. So we're going to see some ancient names of nations and provinces identified here. They're old names. I'm going to be giving you what I believe are their current names today and the lands that they occupy today, the peoples that will be there today. Now, just to tell you up front, we, I mean, it's not as easy as you think, you know, to be able to pick out these names and then and know exactly who they are today. So I'll tell you the ones that are kind of still iffy, but I'm pretty sure that they're correct. Okay, so let's go. First one, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward God of the land of Magog, 
the prince of Roshan shot into Baal and prophesied against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So first off, we have identified here Gog of the land of Magog. And you have to remember this as well. The Lord is the one that is speaking here to Ezekiel. Okay? So this is a direct revelation from God, Yahweh, right to Ezekiel. And he's telling him, say these things out loud, right? to the land, to God of the land of Magog. Well, Gog is an actual title here in this verse, and it means king or leader or even a head prince. He's the leader. He's the one in charge. And he is the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, but he's also the king of the land of Magog. Now, if you're taking notes, you can write down Genesis chapter 10 and just look at those first few verses there. And it identifies Japheth. Remember Japheth? Yeah. Well, he was the son of Noah, right? He came over on the ark. Well, guess what? He had children after they landed, right? And four of his children are identified here in this chapter. But where did Japheth land? I mean, yeah, they landed on that mountain of Ar was it Ar uh, Ararat, right? Ararat. And that's by Turkey and Iran. It's in that corner by those nations, right? And, uh, but Japheth moved to the north. And his four sons moved to the north. We know that in history. It's identified. It's even on your maps in your Bible. Okay. So Magog is today, anybody know? Magog is? Good guess. Russia, yeah, make on is Russia. Russia, yes. Russia. Magog is Russia. Russia today, you know what? Have you been in the news lately? Yeah. They are really against Israel. They've been coming out against Israel. You know why? Because Israel came out against them with every other nation of the world when they attacked Ukraine. Unprovoked at least initially militarily unprovoked attack against Ukraine. So Israel backed Ukraine just like everybody else is, right? Now, I think part of the reason, or the main reason, is because the guy leading Ukraine is Jewish. Yeah, he's Jewish. Now, you know, you hate to say this about people, but he's not the greatest guy in the world. He's just as bad as Putin is, right? Yeah, I mean, if you really look into it, he's got a lot of bad things. He's, he's, you know, he's doing a lot of bad things to his own nation, to his own people. Their, their government is labeled, labeled number one corrupt government in the world. Just look, look it up. It's all there on the internet. I did, yeah. But in any event, Russia is coming out against Israel big time. Big time. All the rhetoric you hear is just a precursor to this war. They're getting ready. They're just getting ready. Now, I think it's going to happen after the Ukraine war is over. And who's going to win that? I mean, you, you see the news is kind of back and forth, back and forth. I don't think Russia was expecting such a great battle coming from Ukraine. And uh, I just heard recently this past few days that Ukraine has now been attacking uh, the strongholds that Russia took over. And then they're starting to win back that. So. Uh, in any event, you know, we have to understand war is bad, folks. There's a lot of innocents in Ukraine that have died because of this war. That's horrible. We need to be praying for God to stop it, right? And that's, that's what we want. But I believe the next war, and it can happen anytime soon, is going to be these people now, Russia and its confederacy going into uh, Israel and trying to take control. Okay, now verse 3. It says, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, if you have a King James Version, it says head prince. The word Rosh, it means head. That's what it means. But it also is a nation as well. And there's a number of verses that identify it as a nation. And I just think that the Hebrew grammar here helps us to put it as a nation instead of being head prince of Meshach and Tubal. But Rosh is very interesting. Uh, a few months ago, Putin came out and said that Rus, R-U-S, Rus, was the ancient Russia. R-U-S. Uh, 
So it's very interesting how he came up, and it just happened a few months ago, and I was like, whoa! I'm like, Ruth, that's Roach. That's Roach in the Bible. So Roach is Russia. Mishach and Tubal, I believe, are Turkey. They're provinces in Turkey. They're not full of nations, neither is Roach. It was just a province, like a county. Verse 4, God's still speaking. I will turn you about, put hooks in your jaws. I will bring you out all, out of all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company of buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. So they're going to be ready for war. This is Ezekiel's way to say, hey, you know what? War is coming. Okay? Now, Russia today has 3 million in active and reserved armed forces. And if, if it's every single one of them, which it probably isn't going to be completely all of them that go in. I mean, you do need to have some people at home to preserve, you know, to protect your home, your home Russia and all that. But you're still talking a, a few million soldiers going into Israel, attacking Israel. Not a good situation for uh, the Jewish people. Okay, now you heard about the programs, right? Programs, late 1900s, early 1900s, Russia, they killed a lot of Jewish people in the land of Russia because they blamed them for their despise on the economic scale. Anytime the economy went down in Russia, they blamed the Jews and then they attacked the Jews. Just, uh, you know, it's a common theme throughout the world, any nation that happens, you know, it happened in Spain and the, you know, and the Inquisition and all that kind of stuff as well. So it happens all the time in a lot of different places. Unfortunately, Jewish people are kind of used to that, and uh, it's not a good thing, though, obviously. So, who's going to help Russia come out against Israel? Well, verse 5, we see Persia, well, let's do 5 and 6. Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all his troops, Beth Togarma from the remote parts of the north, with all its troops, many peoples with you. So Persia today is, somebody said it earlier, Iran, Iran yeah, Iran. Or if you want to say it correctly, Iran in the English. Uh, I like Iran because I'm from Jersey. I'm a New Jersey guy, and, and uh, we always speak incorrectly anyways. So <laughs> it's just the way it is. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> Persia. Persia loved the Jewish people, right? I'm joking, you know that, right? That's a joke. Their goal, I mean, the national goal of Persia, of Iran, is to wipe out Israel. That's their national goal. They have clearly stated it for the last how many years, 20, 30, some odd years, publicly. And, uh, you know, they just, they don't like the Jewish people. They want to wipe them out, kill them all. And so, the interesting thing is, is that Russia and Iran, and another nation which we're going to identify soon, have all gotten together just recently. Had a little, uh, you know, a little conference in Iran, if you can imagine that. And I wonder what they were talking about. I think they were also talking about going against Israel. I believe that. But, uh, you know, of course, they didn't say anything about that. But you know, another thing that just recently came out this week, really, oh, just amazing. Putin declared that he wants a new world order. Did you hear that? Putin now. Now we already know a new world order is in effect. And to me, I'm like, this blows me away, folks. Because the United States, Europe, other nations connecting with them, right? They want a new world order, right? But now, interesting enough, Putin then attacks Ukraine. Putin's against the new world order. United States and the European New World Order, but now he's like, we want a New World Order, and guess who's going to join with him? Iran and other Islamic nations. He has opened the door in Russia now to this world, this New World, this Islamic world. They are going into his nation. He has a lot of Muslim and Islamic peoples now in his nation, and he's giving them some rights and things like that. He's helping them out. And he has decided to have a, and this is fascinating, folks. He's going to have a new, um, a new dollar, a new 
monetary fund or whatever it's called, I don't remember exactly what it is, and he's going to back it with gold and silver. And he's putting the dollars of Russia and Iran and these other nations together. They are working on this already. It's going to be coming out real soon, folks. And he's backing with gold and silver. That's smart. That is real smart. You know, because all the other funds, all the other monies right now, it's all fiat currency, meaning there's nothing backing it. That's why the dollar is going to just, it's going to crash eventually because we're spending so much more money. Every time there's a, more billions of dollars, right, in the budget, and eventually your dollars are just, it's going to go under, folks, so get ready for that. I would get into gold and silver just to have some around hand, you know? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, you hear all those TV commercials about it on the Christian side, right? Yeah, well, that's because they know it's going to happen. So now, now what's happening worldwide, you've got this world order over here, and you've got this world order over here now. So what's going to happen? It's going to clash. It's going to clash. Who's stronger? I don't know. But you know what? You'll see in the end, the one over here, the Russia, New World Order, that's the one that's going to go. You want to know why? It's not prophesied. They're the wrong group of people taking over the world. Go back to Daniel, four beasts. The fourth beast is the Roman Empire. It's not the Russian Empire. It's the Roman Empire. And we're going to see Russia and the rest of these nations, because they go up against Israel to battle, they're going to go under. Okay. All right, let's move on. I'm pontificating here too much. Okay. Is that the right word? Ah, I don't know. It's, it's a big word. I don't know. Okay, verse 5. Persia. Now, the next one that is Ethiopian in your English versions here, but the Hebrew is Cush. And without a long dissertation, I believe Cush is Sudan today, not Ethiopia. It could be part of Ethiopia. The rabbis actually believe a little bit of Ethiopia and uh, Etretia. That's that nation. It's a little tiny nation next to Ethiopia. They believe it all, includes all of that. Uh, but Kush is definitely Sudan today. Sudan is 100% Islamic. And uh, they were very much, uh, had a bad relationship with Israel. But recently, they kind of opened it up. You know what I know why? Because of Trump. The Abrahamic Accords. He started to get some of these Islamic nations to start talking to Israel. Let's have a little peace treaties. Well, they don't have peace treaties yet, but they are opening up economically and strategically and security-wise. They're all kind of doing business together. Sudan is starting to talk now with them. But in the end, they're going to go against Israel in this war. Put next to them is Libya. So Libya, you know, Gaddafi was the leader of Libya, and he was very weak. And so I think the UN started that war just to take out Gaddafi and put their own uh, Islamic, very violent leadership in there. They're still battling over there. You never hear about it anymore. But the groups are all battling each other. They're becoming more and more Islamic. They'll join this war as well. Verse 6, Gomer with all his truth, Beth Togarma. These are interesting. These are the ones that, uh, you know, you're not 100% sure. But I believe he's talking about Turkey. Others believe it's Germany. They think it was the Cimmerians, but the Cimmerians moved all the way up to Germany. They were, they were by the Black Sea area on the north side. Um, but the thing is, we're sticking to locations, to the lands, not the peoples that moved away. You see, we're sticking to the location. And Gomer and Betogarma, I believe, are in that Turkey area. So, in any event, these are the nations that I've identified. They're from the remote parts of the north. Turkey would be considered from Israel to be a remote part, but also Russia is as well, which we'll get to that verse later on. Verse 7 through 9, the invasion of Gog. So we have five nations identified, folks. Russia. We've got Iran. We've got Sudan, Libya, and Turkey. The three big nations, obviously, are Russia and Iran and then Turkey. Those are three bigger nations. Sudan and Libya will just join them, and, and uh, they'll be able to go through the Mediterranean Sea situation, get over there, maybe go through Egypt as well, who knows. 
But uh, Russia and those other nations, they already had their landmass going through them. They'd go right through Syria. Why do you think there was a war in Syria? To get Russia and Iran into Syria. That was it. There was a little war there going on. I mean, yeah, it was, it was not a good war, of course, but Russia and, and Iran came to Syria's defense because they wanted to get into Syria because next is Israel. Now, all you got to do is fly over your soldiers, your equipment, which they have it in there in, in Syria already. They got military bases there, right? They were supposed to pull everybody back after the war was over, right? But, well, you know how that goes. <laughs> and, of course, you know, we've got a, a, a president now that's really not going to say anything about that. Okay. Let's get off of that topic real fast, amen? Okay, verse 7 to 9, the invasion of God now. Be prepared, prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you and be a guard for them. So the Lord is, is actually warning God, God, okay, the leader. He's warning them. After many days you will be summoned in the latter years. You will come into the land that is restored from the sword whose inhabitants have been gathered for many nations to the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual waste. But his people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. And so, when is this going to happen? It tells us right here, in the latter days. Well, guess what, folks? That's a phrase that means in the last days. Do we not live in the last days right now? It could happen any time. They're going to come into the land that was restored from the sword. I believe that's talking about World War II. That's the war where Israel was allowed to finally come back to the land. They were restored, regathered, is the word that we use in the Jewish side. Now, they have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Well, Israel was a wasteland for about 1,900 years from first century to our century, you know, well, the 20th century. Then all of a sudden, Jewish people started buying property back away from the Muslims. Remember, the Muslims owned the whole nation over 100 years ago. They started buying property back, and then in 1948, the UN decided, okay, we'll give you the land, at least part of the land, some of the land, half of the land. But now they've been gathered. They're ready. There's 7 million Jewish people living in the land now. So they're ready. They're ready for this war. And then they are living securely, all of them. You know, the Hebrew word for living securely is betach in the Hebrew, and it means in confidence. Let me tell you, Israel lives in confidence right now. You want to know why? Because they're very confident of their air force, their army, their strategic... They're, they're everything. They're armed forces. They are strong, folks. They're very strong. They're confident. They're ready to roll against anybody. And they're expecting war anytime soon from Lebanon and Syria anytime soon. They've been preparing that for, for uh, the last year or so. Verse 9, you will go up, you'll come like a storm, you'll be like a cloud covering the land. You and all your troops and many peoples with you, so I believe more millions are going to be covering the land of Israel. You see that? Like, you know, like a cloud covering all of a sky. They're going to be everywhere in the land. In the mountains and valleys, they're all over the place. Verse 10 to 13, there's the reason for the invasion. It's a little different reason than you think. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, and remember, he's still talking here. It will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan. I really think they were already devising it. Already in that last, uh, in that last conference that they held with Turkey, Iran, and Russia in Iran. Yeah, they had that conference there. Verse 11, and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest, that live securely or in confidence, all of them living without walls, having no bars or gates. Well, that's the way Israel is today. They don't have those gates and those walls around the, around the cities like they did in ancient times. Verse 12, 
Here's the reason. To capture spoil, to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited, and against the people who are gathered from the nations and who have acquired cattle and goods who live at the center or the navel of the world. Well, first off, folks, I've got to give you some bad news. I hope you're okay with that. The Valley Vista is not the center of the world. <laughs> Sorry. Scripture tells us who is at the center of the world. Israel is at the center of the world. All right. Let's get past that, all right? Now, the reason why they're having this war is to capture, spoil, to seize, plunder. They're not going in trying to wipe out the nation of Israel to kill all the Jewish people, which is what the war at the end is going to be. Armageddon War... You know, when Jesus comes back in the second coming, that's the Armageddon War. They're going up against Jerusalem. They're going up against and the Jewish people. They want to wipe them all out. They just want to kill them all. That's the purpose of the Armageddon War. But this is a different purpose. To capture spoil, to seize plunder. Now, what does Israel have that Russia and Iran would want? How about natural gas? Oil, which they're just tapping into now. They're... Next week, I believe, is when they're going to be taking it out. Taking it out of the sea. They drilled into the sea. Remember, Lebanon is fighting against them, wanting that, that uh, you know, those fields now. So they are actually extracting it by next week or the new week after that, folks. Natural gas and oil. So guess what Putin just announced? Him and Iran, they just made a deal, folks. $80 billion deal for natural gas that they're going to control natural gas around the world. And the prices. It's all in there on the internet. And so Israel now is going to have natural gas. And a lot of it. The United States, we have lots of natural gas and oil, but guess what? Under Trump, yeah, we were number one in the world and exporting and importing and you know, all that. But now, under our current administration, can't do that, you know. So that's why your gas prices are so high. But uh, in any event, so Russia wants to control the natural gas and the oil around the world. They were doing it to Europe. They cut Europe off, right? You're going to join Ukraine? Cut you off. So I believe they're also going into Israel for that reason as well. And guess who's been helping Israel to export it all out of the ground, to dig it all out, you know? Russia. Russia's been helping them. For the last 10 years, they've been helping them. More than 10 years. It was under Obama's administration when he pulled away from Israel, Putin moved in. He said, we'll help you export all that oil and gas, no problem. And... There's a reason for that. No problem, right? All right, moving on. Where am I now? Verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all his villages. Uh, you know, I don't like that English word villages. The Hebrew really means young lions. Okay, young lions can be uh, merchants, leaders. They're young leaders. And we'll say to you, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods to capture great spoil? So they're not only going to go for oil and, and natural gas, they want the silver and the gold and the cattle and the goods. A lot of spoil in Israel, you know, they are doing well, folks, economically. They're doing good. You know, and guess what? You want to feed a lot of people? Well, they've got a lot of vegetables and fruits all throughout the land. Israel's doing good. All right, verse 14 through 16. You know, I hate to say this, but this little clock, it, it kind of threw me off. It says 9.57, and it doesn't move. So I'm thinking, wow, I've got a lot of time left. I'm like, no, let's get moving. 9.57, it keeps on, just, yeah, it's not moving. God's intention, though, what's God's intention for this war? 14 through 16, therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel are living securely, will you not know it? So who are God's people? What's this verse say? My people Israel. 
They're still God's people. We are God's people too, but we have not replaced Israel, folks. We have not overtaken them, right? We haven't replaced them in God's covenant of promises as partakers with them of the olive tree blessings of God. We are able to understand and able to partake with them in the covenant blessings, yes, but we haven't displaced them, okay? God's people, right here. My people, Israel. God has a plan for Israel, and it involves a whole lot of tribulation, unfortunately. But it does involve a whole lot of salvation in the end. In the end, they will believe as a nation. They're going to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. They're going to believe that he died on the cross for their sins. They're going to believe that he resurrected on the third day to give them eternal life and have hope in all of that. They're going to believe it in the end. Now, as an evangelist to the Jewish people, I'm hoping that they're going to believe, you know, now. So we can lead them to the Lord. But, but the Bible says, in the end, that second coming, one-third of the Jewish people that's left over through that tribulation period, they're going to be saved. They're going to believe. Romans chapter 11, verse 26 tells us, and then all Israel will be what? Saved. But it's all Israel that's left over. Because there's going to be war in that tribulation period against Israel, unfortunately. All right. Now, I know. That's a rabbit trail. Let's get back. Let's get back to where are we now? What verse are we in? 16, 17. 16. You're right. 16. You'll come against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. It will come about in the last days. That's the latter years, last days, that I shall bring you against my land. Whose land is it? It's God's land. He gave it to the Jewish people. In order that the nations may know me. Here's one of the reasons now for God's intention. That the nations will know God. When I shall be sanctified through your eyes before, uh, through you before their eyes, O oh God. So when God judges Russia and the other confederacy nations, the world is going to then kind of wake up and say, oh, there's a God of Israel. And they're going to know about him. It doesn't mean they're going to personally know him intimately through Jesus. Possibly there will be revival. Probably there will be some revival around the world. But at least the nations are then going to know that the God of Israel is alive and protecting Israel. Because you're going to see exactly what's going to happen now. This last section here, verse 17 to 23, Gog and Magog judged. God's going to judge them and judge them harshly. He's allowing Russia to go into Ukraine, and they're doing battle. God's not intervening in a way that he's going to intervene in this war. Why? Well, because Israel is God's chosen people, and he's going to protect them in this war. Verse 17. Thus said the Lord God, Are you the one of whom I spoke in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them? The answer, of course, is yes. And it will come about on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. Does anybody here want God to be angry with them? Yeah, I don't think so. Not a good thing to do. You know what I mean? Well, the world doesn't think like we think. Verse 19, And in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So, first, God's judgment, an earthquake in the land of Israel. That's the topic here, right? That's the theme. In verse 20, and the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creepy things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down, the steep pathways will collapse, every wall will fall to the ground. That's in Israel. A lot of damage will be done in Israel. But you know what? Sometimes earthquakes, they're worldwide. You know, I like to say a whole lot of shaking going on, you know, I'm from Las Vegas. <laughs> you know this, right? But lately, if you've noticed, if you do 
you're studying on earthquakes, guess what happens? Some of those earthquakes are worldwide. That means the whole world shakes a little bit on these earthquakes. And it's just been happening the last, what, 10, 20 some odd years or so. Really amazing. So it's possible that the world will shake as well, uh, but the damage is going to be done in Israel here. Verse 21, and I shall call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So first the earthquake happens, and then what? Confusement. Confusion. Confusing stuff happens with the enemies of Israel. They start attacking each other. Yeah, that's happened in Israel's past, has it not? Two times it happened in Israel's past. You got Gideon in Judges chapter 7, Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 14. You can check that out. Go look them up, uh, you know, your homework uh, for assignment for this week. And you just see what happens. The enemies, they just start fighting each other. They get confused. Well, God allows it to happen. He's the one that does it. Verse 22, and with pestilence and with blood, I shall enter into judgment with him. I shall rain on him, on his troops, on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So the soldiers in Israel that are not of Israel are going to be attacked. Hailstones, fire, brimstone, kind of reminds you of what in the past? Sodom and Gomorrah. How about the ten plagues against Egypt? Hailstones, a hundred pounds coming down from the sky. You think that's going to hurt? <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think the angels are going to be up there with their slingshots and just picking off all the soldiers. Brimstone, you know, that's the, that's the, sul the, the, uh, the sulfur and fire, brimstone, hailstone. I mean, it's not going to be fun, babe. Uh, it's not going to be fun, folks. So, uh, yeah, but the, uh, a lot of those soldiers, you know, they're going to be dying. Uh, all of them are going to be dying. Verse 23, and here's the point. Here's the point. I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself, make myself known in the sight of many nations. They will know that I am Yahweh, personal name of God, the Lord above all lords, God of all kings, right? King of all kings, God of all gods. They will know that God is God, right? The God of Israel, the one that we worship, they're going to know. Not on an intimate basis, but can you imagine everybody with today's knowledge and today's, uh, you know, everybody's got their little phones and their cameras and videos, and it's going to be all over CNN. It's going to be all over the Internet. You're going to see, everybody's going to see it. Whoever's going to have phone around the world, they're all going to be able to see. What do you think this is going to do to the world? Russia, Iran, Turkey, and the other two nations? Kaput. Now why do I say that? These scriptures only talk about the attack that's within Israel. However, go to chapter 39. Now look at verse 6. Chapter 39, verse 6, God says this, And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. So not only is he going to attack all the soldiers in the land, he's going to attack their nations as well. Magog is Russia. The coastlands are all the other nations. Turkey, Iran, they all have coastlands. They're all attached to the sea or the ocean. And so God is going to destroy their nations, folks. Remember we talked about over here, we've got the United States and Europe, New World Order, and then we have the Russian New World Order. This New World Order now, kaput. So what do you think is going to happen over here? They're going to take control of the world, move the world into a New World Order, which is biblically prophesied in Daniel. It's the Roman Empire. Do you remember Obama kept on saying, we got to be like who? we got to be like the EU, yeah. European Union. He said that a lot. And guess what we're doing now under Biden? we got to be like them. He's not saying it as much, but he's doing it. He's doing it all behind the scenes. Got to be like them. Why do we got to be like them? 
Why can't we be like the old United States of America? Amen? That's what we need. We need to get back to the way it was. Nothing wrong with the olden ways, right? The good old days. Nothing wrong with that. You know what they say? You know, if it ain't, if it ain't broken, then why fix it? But, you know, I think the U.S., we can still do some fixing, even from the olden days. We just make it better. We need to get back to being a Christian nation, not a post-Christian nation. Amen? Amen. All we got to do is our part, folks. That's all we got to do. Do our part here in Valley Vista and Kingman and wherever the Lord leads you. That's all we're responsible for. Okay, last verse. Last two verses. I want you to see this now, 9 and 10, and then we'll end. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs, spears, and for seven years they will make fires of them. And they will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, or they will make fires with the weapons, and they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord. So, that tells us right there that Russia and Iran and the nations were able to take the plunder. That means they won the war. They covered the whole land with their soldiers. Obviously, they win the war, right? Israel just can't defend themselves against all that. So, well, what happens is God wipes them out. Pestilence, right? Pestilence is disease, so their soldiers are all going to die. They got the hailstones, the fire, the brimstone. So now, for the next seven years after the war, they're going to go and collect all the weapons and use them for firewood. In their homes, in their businesses, right? Russian rifles, Russian handguns are made out of, guess what? Wood. Very dense wood and metal as well. But wood, dense wood. World War II veteran told me that. I looked it up. He was right. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing how it all just lines up. They're going to be able to take the weapons and use them for firewood. But for seven years, they're going to do it. Now, the Millennial Kingdom, folks, it tells us that the weapons of the world are going to be transformed into what? Plowshares. Plowshares and pruning hooks. Pruning hooks is for grapes. Taking the grapes off the vine. Well, there's a whole lot of vines in Israel. And so, I believe that this war could happen at any time, and it will, at least three and a half years prior to the tribulation period beginning. Because you've got seven years. Well, the first three and a half years of the tribulation period is pseudo-peace for Israel. It's a pseudo-peace. So, three and a half years plus three and a half years prior to that is then seven years. So at least three and a half years prior to tribulation beginning, period beginning, I believe that they'll be starting to do this seven year period of collecting all the weapons. Now, it could be many years prior to the tribulation period as well. I just said at least three and a half. So folks, what do we got to do with all this knowledge? We're living here in Valley Vista. It's not going to affect us, right? We've got to pray. We have to pray. It does affect us spiritually because we're connected to Israel. We're spiritually connected to Israel as believers of Jesus. Why? Because he was Jewish. These are his people. These are his people. He loves the Jewish people. He loves all people the same, right? But the Jewish people are the ones that seem to be getting attacked the last 2,000 years all the time by the world. So we need to pray for them, pray for their peace, pray for their salvation, and pray. We can't pray that this war won't ever happen. Because then we're praying against the scriptures. But we can pray that God just bless the Jewish people in that process and protect them as best as possible, but that they get saved ahead of time as well. Because there's going to be a lot of people dying, of course. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory. We just pray for Israel, Lord. Yes, they are your chosen land, your chosen people. We pray for your peace to be upon them. We pray for salvation to go through the land right now. And the Jewish people all over the world, wherever they are, Lord. That's why we have ministries pertaining just to the Jewish people, like mine. Although we include all people, because everybody needs to be saved. 
You love us all, Lord, the same, but you do have a special place for Israel because you chose them a long time ago through Abraham, your promises to Abraham, Lord, and to David, and you will fulfill them in the end. But Lord, there's going to be tribulation until that time for these Jewish people. So we pray for their salvation, pray for your protection, pray that you just work mightily in their lives. And Lord, we pray for our nation as well. Can't forget us, Lord God. There's a big battle, spiritual battle going on for this nation and the soul of the nation. Lord, we pray that you will win the battle. Help us, Lord, to do our part, but help other believers around the nation and the world to keep on spreading the good news message of Jesus. That's how we can have a Christian nation once again. Through revival, Lord, through people getting saved. And help the leadership as well, Lord, to be saved. Though they all desperately need it, Lord. We just pray your protection upon us as well. Pray these other nations around the world will not attack our nation as well. We just pray there's not going to be a World War III, which has been planned for a long time. We pray that that will not occur, Lord, and that you will help, help this world to turn to Jesus. And maybe there's a person here today that has yet to make a decision for Jesus, to follow Jesus, to believe in Jesus. Maybe you're still kind of sitting on the fence. But I can tell you right now, you need to make up your mind, and today's the day of salvation. So we pray the Holy Spirit would touch your heart to believe, to believe on Jesus, to give your life to Him. It's really a, a decision of the heart, mind and heart, that we have to repent, turn away from our simple lifestyle, understanding that our sins are going to send us to hell for eternity. We don't want to go there. It's not a good place. But Jesus is the answer and the only answer. He died for all those sins, past, present, and future in your life. And that means forgiveness. And forgiveness is the place we want to be with God. He'll forgive us because all we have to do is agree with Him that we're sinners and that we have sin and that we're sorry for them. We've hurt people, we've hurt ourselves. We need to just declare Jesus. We're sorry for our sins and that we believe in Him as our sacrifice for our sin. He took our place. He took our penalty. And then He rose from the dead on the third day to show us, hey, there's life eternal. And we're going to live it eternally, just wherever we're going to be, heaven or hell. And I know we want to be in heaven. So, if there's a person here today, and anybody listening on the internet, if you want to be saved today, you want to give your heart to Jesus, Give your mind to Jesus. Say this prayer with me. Just say, hey, Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for my personal sins. Thank you, Jesus, for resurrecting. I now receive you as my Lord, my Savior, my God, my Messiah. Help me to live a life of following you the rest of my days. I know I'm not perfect and I'm not going to be perfect, but God does not expect me to be perfect. I just need to be giving of myself to Jesus each and every day. Help me to follow you all my days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.